Hello and beautiful, welcome back to this world is a live channel. I'm Adrian Dumonti from Melbourne, Australia, doing a, a lot of videos, messages for you guys. A little bit of me, I accepted Christ in 1992, ever since walking and growing in Christ. I've been teaching and preaching His Word for the last 15 years now. We as a team felt inspired by the Lord to share some of our teachings on YouTube. which will bless you guys. We have done a few talks just before I start this, this message. We have done a few talks and it's all accessible in, in this channel. World is alive. So just have, you all you have to do is click on and be blessed with all the messages. A couple of them are already put up for you guys in YouTube. You can also visit us on Facebook, which is Aidan DeMonte at Answerable Faith. Aidan DeMonte at Answerable Faith. So be blessed. I hope the Lord blesses you and give you a revelation of His Word. Well, we're going to look at another important one in this moment. This is on, based on the Old Testament, one of the book of the Old Testament. A book is used by many, all, many of the writers, most of the motivational speakers, both secular and Christian, uses this book. And you guessed it, it is the book of Proverbs. A well-known book. Many, of, many people use this book for motivation insights. You know, Proverbs written by King Solomon who is the son of David, king of Israel, who was the son of David, I should say, has written this book, and he written another few more books of his. Now the word Proverbs actually means in Hebrew, to be like. The word Proverbs in Hebrew means to be like. Proverbs can be defined a short statement based on long experiences. Those is wise people came up with, with words of wisdom. They used proverbs. Those are based by their whole experiences that they had in life. And likewise, this king of Israel, Solomon, has written this book. In fact, the theme of proverbs is basically wisdom, which is the right use of knowledge. For wisdom is more than an intellectual pursuit. Wisdom is actually means the right use of knowledge. And in fact, the whole theme of Proverbs is wisdom. And that's why, as I said earlier, <coughs> secular and Christian groups, motivational speakers, quotes, quotes from this book a lot. Now what you're going to see today is from Proverbs 3, verse 5. 5 to 6. We're looking at Proverbs. Proverbs 3 was 5 to 6. And I captioned the message today is the convergence on the mouth and the provision of the Almighty. It's a mouthful of a statement. The convergence on the mount and the provision of the Almighty. I look at Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Before I start, I will love, I always like to say every promise in the Bible comes with a condition or a criteria if you like, which sets the platform or ground to be fulfilled. Every promise from Genesis to Revelation, every promise which is contained in the Bible, in Genesis to Revelation, always comes with a condition or criteria before, before the promise. A criteria that sets platform or ground to be fulfilled. The mistake is to take a promise without knowing the criteria or without knowing the condition which is, has to be fulfilled. Likewise, look here <coughs> in Proverbs chapter 3, I'll read 5 to 7. 
Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. A well-known scripture. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. We will meditate and study this three words. Two verses for now. The first thing that comes up here, trust, isn't it? It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. What is trust? What is exactly trust? We hear this word quite a number of times in our conversations. When we talk to people, when we're describing something, when people describe us something, the word trust is very often used among us. But what exactly trust is? Trust, according to definition over here, is a conscious effort in your mind to take for granted the, in the integrity, strength and ability of the person you know talking about trusting someone. Trust is, you're talking about trust. What is trust? Trust is taking, take, is a conscious effort. A conscious effort in our mind for what? To take for granted take for granted the integrity the strength the ability of the person who you know, of the person you know. Very brief definition of trust. So when we say trust in, in a person, when we say we're trusting someone, what are we doing is, we consciously making an effort in our mind to take, the grant, to take for granted the integrity, the strength, the ability of the person. And obviously, you trust someone, only you know them. That's what the definition says. A conscious effort in your mind to take for granted the integrity, the strength, the ability of the person you... You know, this is uh, Webster's Dictionary of, on trust. This is trust. And when you look at the Bible, says it says trust the Lord with all thy heart. And it goes on. So we have a handle here what is trust. Now, on the other hand, we also know another kind of word which we use, which is belief. The second one, I want you to mention that, though it's not a part of the scripture, but I wanted to mention that so you can, do, you can know the difference between trust and belief. Second one is belief. Now what is belief? <coughs> we see trust. What is belief? I can, sh I can tell you for sure, belief is not the same as trust. But then what is belief? Belief, according to the definition of game, Belief is a conviction of the truth of some statement or reality of some being, thing or phenomenon, especially when it's based on examination of evidence. That's all it is. So when you say belief, it's a conviction of the truth of some statement that we, we think is true. So it's a conviction of the truth of some statement of a reality, I'll write it down so that you can compare it, 
So belief again is a conviction. What is a conviction? That you really think it is. A conviction of a statement. It's, it's a conviction of a statement. It's a conviction of, of the truth, of something. Something or some some statement or reality, very very important thing of somebody somebody Of course, based on the examination of the evidence. Is there a difference? Belief is that you think that you are actually think is real of something you feel is to be true, or some statement, or some reality, or of or some or somebody. That's that's on belief. No. So you can see the difference between trust and a belief. Trust is, is different than a belief. Trust is a conscious on a conscious effort on your mind to take for granted. You just trust that person. You, you, you trust that person because of the integrity you see in that person, because of the strength you see in that person, because of the heritage you see in that person, that you person that you know. Now belief on the other hand is just that you are just convicted that is true. Reality or phenomenon or a person could be anything, but that's a conviction that you have. Now, now you look at, and that's why you look at even the belief of Christianity. Romans 10 9 tells you, If thou confess with thy mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ and shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him up from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. You see, even Christianity starts with this starting edge. Of course, the entire faith of Christianity is just believing, confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that Jesus is God, that God raised him up, and you shall be saved. That is Romans, Romans 10, 9 tells you, That's, that's Christianity. When you believe, yeah, it's 10, 9, that's it, yeah. And then you go to 16 of Hacks, you find the same thing. 1631 tells you a similar thing. It tells you, 1631, you read, you look that, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. This is Paul and Silas when they were in prison, the jailer. Uh, gets convicted when he sees Paul and Silas out. The prison breaks and they come out. And the jailer asks, "What should, should, should he should do to be saved?" And he answered, "Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved and thy house." That that is one. There is again hacks. Now, why we need to know all this is important to make that difference. Acts 16.31 says that. Now, so this is belief when you have trust in the front and top. All right? Now, we're moving on to the message. Now, what are we looking here? We're looking at in Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. We've seen what is trust, we've seen what is belief. Now, to trust someone, as I said, it goes beyond belief on God. It's to trust in God. 
Now, John 1 4, if you turn your Bible to John 1 4, I'll show you one before we go on. John, it's important to always have scripture as a reference. You go to John, John, Gospel of John 1 45 to 40 to 50, tells you. Tells you about someone called Nathaniel, you uh, know, of the holiest disciple, and how he comes. Philip brings him to Jesus, and Jesus tells him straight away, Behold, an Israelite deed in whom is no guile. And Nathaniel said unto him, in verse 48, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said, Before thy Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. And then in verse 50 of Gospel of John 1, Jesus answer said, Believe, I said unto you, I saw you under, under the fig tree, you believe. Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he goes on to say what, what he meant by that. So here you find Nathaniel. When he comes to Jesus, Philip brings him to Jesus and he tells that he found the Messiah and Nathaniel he comes as a skeptic, not really sure, but since Philip calls him, he comes. But when before he could come, Jesus looks at him and tells him something where he's where he's been from. And Nathaniel gets very taken up with that and he says, How do you know me? And he says, Lord, I believe that you are I believe that you are a son of God. He says, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. This is 49, Nathaniel said, thou art the king of Israel. And then Jesus tells a very profound statement. He looks at him and says, you believe me because I, I told you where you came from. He says, you see greater things than this. See, there's something that has to go beyond belief. That's the point I'm trying to bring, bring today with these scriptures. Trust goes beyond belief. You like I'll explain to you as we go. Trust is beyond merely belief on God. A strong word from James, if you see here, you'll be surprised. James tell you very very something very differently. And you'll be surprised to see. In two nineteen of James, chapter two of nineteen, he tells you, Thou believe that there's one God? Thou does well, he says James. The devils also believe and tremble. Now what does James are saying? James is talking about a different context. He's talking about just belief is not enough. He's talking about faith and works. But the point is, he says, belief is a common and fundamental thing. But something has to go beyond belief. And James injects that very clearly. He says, even the devils believe that Jesus is God. And here in Proverbs, you see very clearly, Solomon talks about trusting with God with all your heart. He never said believe in the Lord. He says trusting in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. So we just looked at the backdrop. I just wanted to lay you the foundation of what is trust, what is belief. And we've seen some from scripture portions of belief and trust. Now, we're going into the message. Four things come here, comes here in this, in this verse 5 to 7 of Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Four things. If you read that word properly and clearly, God will open your understanding to see four things there. What are the four things? <coughs> the first one, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not your understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. It's the first thing you see coming out from that five to six verse is heart. Is it there? Heart. Second one is understanding. Very important. 
heart understanding. So you have one heart, second understanding. Third is ways. And the fourth is paths. It's very simply put. Read 5 and 6 verse of Proverbs 3. You see heart, understanding, ways, and paths. In fact, to put it more personally, is our heart, our understanding, our ways, our paths. How do I say that? He says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. So, in other words, trust in the Lord with all our heart. Trust in the Lord with all our, all our heart, all our understanding, our ways and our paths. I'll show you how, how we go into it. But you see four things clearly coming here. Heart, understanding, ways and paths. I want you to note, paths is impurial and ways are impurial. Just note that as we go. The writer points out to, to these four functions that we come under and operate in our lives. Please listen to me very carefully. First one, there's a connection, yummy, between these four functions. First, first application I'm putting to, to you. First application, there's a connection between four functions. Each one, what do I, do I mean by that? Each one is connected to each one. So there's a connection between these four functions. They do not flow separately or independently from the other. Four are here, but four are interconnected. They do not flow separately or independently from the other. First, first observation to look. Second one is, there is also an order in the connectedness. How do I say that? The first observation we see, they are not separately. They all are connected to each other. Second one is, they are, there is an order in their connectedness. How do you know that? Look at the scripture. Trust in the Lord with the whole of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your, in all your ways, you shall direct your path. <laughs> you see, there is an order. For the Lord to direct your paths, there's something has to be done before. And then something has to be done before. And then something has to be done in the beginning. And you see a holder. There's a holder there. For, for you to reach here, you have to follow or move to a process. That's why I said there is a holder in the connectedness. <coughs> Second one, or rather, the first. This is the first observation which has two points. So there's a connection between four functions. They don't flow independently. They flow together. The second one in the first ob observation is there's, there's an order the kind of this. The second big one is the writer actually puts four functions in two sections or compartments. You can see that. Follow me. So it's such deep revelation in these two small few verses. <laughs> The writer actually puts four functions into two sections. These are four functions, but they are put in two se sections. He joins the first three, you know, together, and the last function separately. How do I say that? He joins the first, first three together, and the last one separately. He goes on to say, the last function is directly affected by the previous three. 
and these three determines the result. Are you getting me this in this moment? It's such a simple but deep teaching. These three, as I said, I repeat once more, is joined together. So I said there's two sections. This is one section and this is one section independently. These three are joined together and this is separately kept. Now as I said, the last function is affected by the first three. Verse five. So we're going to look at each one separately. Heart. You look at heart. What is heart? Heart simply means the center of all total personality, other than other than being of a, a, a organ in the body. But metaphorically, a heart is a total personality with reference to intuition, feeling, and emotion. Many times the Bible talks about heart. It talks about from the heart proceeds or rather produces the issues of life. If you look at, if you look at uh, Proverbs, again go back to Proverbs 4, this one, two pages away, 4, 4.23 tells you, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for how to fit are the issues of life. If you want to note it, it's, it's chapter 4, 23. You see? I said art metaphorically means a set of all total personality, with reference to institution, with reference to feeling and emotion. Bible tells you what is heart again from the Bible from the biblical view it is it is a place where all issues of life comes out that's what it is a place where all the issues of life in fact the Bible instructs says to keep it carefully to diligently keep it keep the heart with all diligence Proverbs 4:23 keep your heart with all diligence because for how to fit are issues of life. The second one about the heart that the Bible refers, which, which I have discovered and found, is Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells you, the heart is deceitful above all things. This is the prophet Jeremiah. The heart is deceitful about all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It's, it's Jeremiah 79. You can check it in your Bibles. Jeremiah tells us the heart is weak, des desperately wicked. And Jeremiah says, who can know it? Powerful words. 79. Who can know it? The heart is deceitfully above all things. Deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked, who can know it? So, why I'm saying these two things? I gave one scripture, the Proverbs speaking about the issues of life. And here, Jeremiah tells that it's so, it can be so delicate and dangerous as well. So that's the heart, the center of all personalities, uh, center of, of total personality. Many, many times even Christ made reference to the heart. He said, whatever comes out comes from the heart that defines a person. So heart is so important. <laughs> the second one is understanding. What is understanding? Again, we know understanding is a mental process that we grasp things, that we, we we draw things, things that we see, things that we feel, things that we experience. That is, it's a personal interpretation of things happens around us. Each of us understand things the way that we see it. So it's a mental process. We we grasp we, we grasp things based on seeing, based on feeling, based on experiencing, and then we give our own personal interpretation to things. That's understanding. Third one, 
ways. What is ways? Ways are simply methods of doing things, accomplishing things, manner in which something is done or happens. In fact, Proverbs 16, 2 tells you, all the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Again, ways. So ways is the way that we do things, the method or the style, if you like, that we do things. <coughs> now verse 6 of Proverbs 3, it says, In all your ways, acknowledge Him. That's, that's where ways come. After He's asked us to trust, trust the Lord with all our heart, and after He's asked us to lean out on our own understanding, He goes on to ways. He says, acknowledge your God with all your ways. <laughs> what is to acknowledge? Acknowledge is to admit, to recognize the authority or the validity of God in our lives. Again, let me go back and explain to you about, understand, he's asking us to lean not on our own understanding. What is to lean? Lean is to just either permanently or temporarily move to one side literally means is to lean on and and Bible is actually instructing us not to lean on our own understanding. Understanding just how we see understanding is the way we, we look at things, the way we interpret things. Bible is asking us to not to lean on our own understanding. Not to put yourself on the side, not to to depend if you like, depend on our understanding. And then you find, he says, in all your ways, acknowledge who? Acknowledge Him, God. In all our ways, He's asking us to acknowledge Him. Now we're going to look at this four qualities today, you see, heart. All this is talking in the context of trust. Heart, understanding, ways and parts. We know what is heart, we, we see what is understanding. We, we know that we should not lean in our own understanding. We should acknowledge God in whatever we do, our methods, our styles, which is the ways. And then, and then only the scripture says, he shall, shall, shall is a very definite word in English, shall direct thy path, not he may. But he shall, means he will direct your paths. So we're going to look at one example from the Old Testament and to see how all this converges, how this all comes together. Turn your Bible if you like. We're going to look at the we're going to look at from the life of Abraham. And you see all this fall is embodied there. And I'm going to show you from why many many years after Solomon writes the four things and you see Abraham actually embodies all this four. Turn your Bibles to, to Genesis 22 1 to 14. I'm going to leave this for you because we're going to look at it from Genesis. Genesis 1, I'll just give you the scripture here so if you wanted to Genesis 22, 1 to 14. We all know the story very well. This is, this is a story about Abraham taking his son to Hophor as God commanded him to do. It's a very known story a history actually, what really happened and how God into me. I'm going to read the story quickly just for you and me to have an idea of it. Verse 22, so Genesis, uh, chapter 22 of Genesis 1 to 14. And it came to pass that God did tempt Abraham and said unto Abraham, and said, Behold, here I am, Abraham said. He said, Take now thy son, thy holy Isaac, whom thou love, and get thee 
into the land of Moriah and offer him for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains. And I will tell thee. The ape, then Abraham stood up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, rose up and went to the place which God told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place far off. Abraham said unto his young men, Abide here there with the ass and hide, and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son, and took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went both together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, Father, my father, and said, Yeah, I my son. He said, Behold the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for a, for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a, a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to a place where God had told him, and Abraham built an altar and laid the wood and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar of the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took his knife to slay his son. And the angel Lord called unto him out of heaven, said, Abraham, Abraham, said, here I am. Lay not your hand, neither on the boy. And now I know that the fear of God, seeing that thou had not be done the son, thy holy son, for me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up a burnt offering in the stead of a son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Marvel story. Such a bold story. But I want you to look at the application comes. I want you to look at these four things emerges there. I'm going to show you slowly as we read the story. And we'll read it later as well. It's a well known story. Abraham, <clears throat> this man Abraham, called a friend of God, believed in God, was counted for righteousness. He left everything when God asked him to. He left his family and his land. But now, hear me, Abraham is standing in a situation where he is confronted, hear me, with his belief and his trust in God. Now Abraham is standing in a situation where he's confronted with this belief that what he knows about God and his trust in God. I want, to follow, I want you to follow me. See, Abraham gets a son, hear me, after waiting for 100 years. How long? 100 years. Abraham gets a son after waiting for 100 years. Hear me, just to find out that he has to let him go for God. That puts you and me, hit us back in our couch and think, what? <clears throat> he gets a son after so many years and just to find out that God has, that he has to let it, let it go for God. How would you feel? After waiting for something, hear me, it can be anything in your life as you listen to this, after waiting for something for so precious of several years, so precious to you for several years, and just when you got it, you realize you have to let it go for God. How would you respond? I don't think your belief in God will rescue you from a struggle to understand the truth. No matter how you believe in God, but when you come to a point, when you come to the mount of convergence, where your belief has to converge with the trust. <coughs> yes, I know God. Yes, I know God is good. Yes, I know everything. But Abraham is coming to a point that God is asking him, that one that you waited for 100 years, that one you have precious to you, that one I wanted for me. I want him for me. How would you like that, as I said? Something that you're waiting for several years, and you get it after a long time, and you're about to give, or, or, I want to tell people of, of your story <clears throat> and then to realize that you had to let it go. 
for good. Not for a while, but for good. I don't think you, your belief in God will rescue you from your struggle to understand the truth. What is happening here? You'll be thinking. Abraham went to the same thing. Abraham went to the same thing. It's nothing different there from Abraham. You look at him, he went to the same thing. You see in verse 7, Abraham speak, Isaac starts talking to Abraham, asking, Father, where is the burnt offering? Abraham responds to his son in such a way that he does not really lie to him. At the same time, he does not reveal what was said to him by God. You know, my friend, it's the hardest thing in life, isn't it? There has come a time in your life and my life that God has spoken to you and you only know that. No one else. Here you find Abraham having that in such a way that he, he responds to Isaac, his son. He says, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. He was not lying. He was not, tell, he was not either revealing what God spoke to him. He says, beautiful, he said, rather you will say, Abraham, use a profound statement. You find that, that statement of belief and trust in the sovereign God is coming together. That's why I, I captioned this message, Convergence on the Mount. <coughs> he knows God as his friend. He knows God. He, God, he, he believed God to leave everything in his family. He's come a long way. He is accountable for righteousness. But there comes to a point at the mount that his belief has to meet up with his trust. Until this point, Yami, all experience that Abraham had with God is going to be nothing compared to what is going to happen now to Abraham. Now. All this, until this point, all that these experience Abraham had about God is going to be nothing compared to what is going to happen now. God wanted to move Abraham from a level of believing Yummy to a level of trusting him completely. From a level of believing to a level of trusting him completely. <coughs> it is possible to believe in God and not to trust him. Hear me. It is possible to believe in God and not to trust Him. Verse 9 and 12 tells us, the right moment in verse 9 you find and 12 if you read, the right moment God showed up to honor His belief, to mix with, honor His belief mixed with trust, the sovereign one. He's about to, He takes up His knife in verse 9, tells you, Verse 10, Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Not too late, not too early. The angel of the Lord called him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, lay not thy hand upon your lad. You know, verse 13 tells us God had a plan to Abraham, Abraham's high to see the provision of God. I want to say something here. If you look at verse 13 here, it's very interesting to watch. This man goes with the sand to the mount. And he's sure as he's sure that God wants to, he should lay his knife on. At this point, all he knows is he trusts God. He doesn't know how, he doesn't know when, but he knows for sure that he trusts God with all his heart. His belief on him, his trust on him. And he takes the knife to stretch at just the right time, about to touch the body of his son Isaac. The Lord stops him. What do you call it? Pico seconds? Abraham was not doing a slow motion there. He was not saying that I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it now. He took a stretch, his knife, and his almost seconds to touch the body of Isaac. God can work in picoseconds, in nanoseconds, in picoseconds, in, in faster than light. His speed is more faster than anything else. 
He was not having a knife and saying, Lord, are you, are you listening? I'm going, no, no. He went all for it. And before it actually touched him, the voice got him. That is the God we serve. It shows up always in time. And you find you. And what really interests me is, verse 13 tells you, when Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, he seen a ram. Wait a minute. What happened to his eyes? That all of a sudden now we've seen it. That he never seen when he brought his son up to the mount. You realize that? And all of a sudden when he when he meets the obedience of God, when he's mixed his trust and his belief together, all of a sudden his eyes opens out and he sees the ram like that. All of a sudden when he he that's what God wants me to do. It's like the Lord suddenly opens his eyes and he sees a ram there. Now how big that place can be? The halter. You would not see a ram ram next there. <coughs> and you are in that place. It's a halter of burnt sacrifice. But Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold a ram. And Abraham knew exactly what to do at the moment. He went and took the ram and offered it. Sometimes revelations can come, hear me, from God when you believe and trust in Him, when He wants you to be in a place. Sometimes your eyes can only open when you've done what God wants you to do. Because you see that in Abraham's life. He is in the altar. Even Isaac asked, where is the lamb? Because I, I, Isaac could not see the lamb, neither did, neither did Abraham can see it. But after he's done what he, had, he was supposed to do, all of a sudden his eyes opened, something like from his eyes fell off, and he's seen the provision of God. Verse 14, it was his conviction of God that he said, I'll call this place Jehovah Jireh. What that means? Lord who provides the amount of the Lord which shall be seen. The Lord who provides came only after his coming to trust God. You know I me. Mean? Only when we are able to move from a from arena of belief to trust in God, we will be able to experience God as He is and say, God is my provider. See the latter see the later part of the latter part of the verse 14. <coughs> In fact, the other translation tells you, on the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Abraham met his provision on the mountain. Which mountain? Not just a literary mountain, but a mountain where his belief converged was converged with his trust. When his belief was converged with his trust on that mount, he see another dimension of God. God showed a mountain in verse 2, you see. Abraham had to climb to the mountain of the... You know what I see here? Abraham had to climb on that mountain of his heart. He has to climb the mountain of his understanding. He had to trust God with all his heart. Imagine, I don't think even his wife knew that he's going to take his son to offer. <coughs> because that, that revelation or that instruction only came 